I'm really very grateful for, for being here. I have prepared a joke, but I'm not going to tell it because when people are saying jokes, it means that they're not really moved. And for me, coming here first was a surprise uh, because we have not been working with Klaus so close as many other people. Uh, but also it was very interesting, personally, because I'm starting to understand that in the last two or three years, I'm much more interested in the German debate than ever before in my life, which is, uh, uh, and as a result of it, what I'll do is the following. If you see and compare 20th century with this first 15 years, 20th century was trying to ask the question why things that, does not work in the that work in theory does not work in practice. And it was not only about Marxism. This was about different type of a normative visions that have been not realized. I do believe in the last 15 years we're starting asking totally different question. Why th things that does not work in theory survive in practice? how you're going basically to explain certain type of realities. And from this point of view, I was very much uh, positively provoked by a piece that uh, recently Klaus wrote on the participatory inequality in the austerity state. So what I'll try to do is basically reflect on this. And talking about transition, I'm trying to use the fact, we're talking about transition always having in mind Eastern Europe. I'm much more interested to what extent the practice, the experience of transition to democracy in Central and Eastern Europe is affecting the current debate on Europe. To what extent European idea and vision for the future is not based on certain type of practices, what worked and why it did work, if it worked in Central and Eastern Europe. This is the question. So this is going to be about transition, but it's not going to be about Eastern Europe. Because from this point of view, 1989 was a strange thing. Everything changed. <coughs> But nothing changed much because on the level of ideas, and many people have been making this point, not a single new idea came after 1989. On the level of theory, this was not kind of a great time. But on the level of reality, first of all, for the first time, you have a global market. Global market became possible because of the end of communism, basically the collapse of communism. Secondly, as a result of it, you have this type of end of history. I don't know what the end of history means, but basically it means that there is no clear ideological alternative. Democracy now is lonely. It is not comparing itself with anybody anymore. It's very much about the legitimacy within the society and not its legitimacy vis-a-vis -vis the communism. And as a result of the absence of communism, and I'm very much now following on Stephen, uh, the position of the elites changed a lot. This reformism of fear about basically which Rosenwald was talking has disappeared because there is no strong incentive in this new environment for the elites to look for the cooperation of the people. People in a certain way are a problem because first of all, this 5% are also the creative class. They're the producers now go to Bill Gates of the Worlds and others, and basically they said, we're the producers. It's a very different elite. For the first time, we have an elite that works more than their employees. Uh, and you have a totally different understanding of what it, be, it means to be an elite. Uh, if you're trying to see how these people writing about creative class and financial people, they're describing themselves, they're describing themselves very much in the way Marx has been describing, describing uh, the working class. This is the new universal class, basically the emancipating humanity. Uh, and I do believe that this is quite interesting, but in order to try to present uh, uh, this type of a new state of democracy, I'll start with a novel. Because there is this Portuguese author, Saramago, who has uh, several novels which, in my view, should be simply taught in political science courses because they're great uh, case studies on this. And there is this famous novel called Seeing, uh, the plot of the book is a very simple one. There was a rainy day in a country that resembles Portugal. Till 4 p.m. on the voting day, nobody went to the ballot boxes. At 4 o'clock, people start coming. But when the political parties, and of course they have the party of the left, the party of the right, the party of the center, when they start counting the votes, more than 70% of the votes have been a blank, blank vote. It's not that people didn't vote. They went and they simply put a blank vote. The government was totally shocked because this is the way of delegitimizing democracy. For the first time, you cannot claim, like in the, take, uh, in the, time, uh, in the case of abstention, that it's a passive support. So they decided to have a second elections. And on the second elections, 83% of the votes have been blank. What are you doing in this? 
Because for me, the major problem is, can you govern without legitimacy? Can you have a kind of post-legitimate government? What the government did, basically, they tried to see who organized it. But from this point of view, I do believe Saramago is totally genius, because all the social and political movements, he's describing them as a kind of epidemics, not as revolutions. Nobody knows where it comes from probably from Twitter. But basically, there is no ideology. Nothing keeps these people together. And this is not a kind of a classical revolting people. They don't have claims. I find this very important in order to understand what kind of a situation we're facing. Because this is even people who go and, on the level of body language, do things that very much looks like protest. For example, the Occupy movement and others. You're going to be surprised that they don't have very much of policy claims. It's not very much what you want to change. It's much more statement. I have a moral problem with the other. Basically, I have a legitimacy problem, but not in terms of uh, uh, basically procedural legitimacy. This is about the moral legitimacy. This is why all these beautiful uh, words like dignity and so on are so popular these days, because you don't know what they mean. Uh, because it's very subjective. Uh, I mean, uh, so I'm saying this because uh, if you go to the Voice of the People survey done by the Gallup International, for the last several years, and this is before the crisis, you're going to see three very interesting trends. First, democracy is now universally accepted as the best form of government. But this is slightly like what Bagehot talked about the monarchy. He said the, the strength of the monarchy is that people, it's easier for them to imagine. So he said people govern not by the strength of their imagination, but by the weakness of their imagination. Uh, so from this point of view, democracy is the universally accepted because nobody knows what it is not democracy. And nobody pretends to be not democrat. The Russians, they're saying that they're democracy, but just a sovereign democracy. Chinese, they're probably a democracy with the Chinese characteristics. Uh, uh, so from this point of view, nobody is attacking it. So the second interesting story is that Central and East Europeans were the least enthusiastic about the fact that democracy is the best form of government. So, and the third, citizens in democratic Central and Eastern Europe claimed Basically, there are few of them claiming that they can influence the decision of their governments, even compared with the citizens in Putin Russia. It's not to make much more of it. Uh, my feeling how much they can influence the, the decision making in Putin's Russia is slightly different than theirs, but this is a perception. So you have a people who basically are for democracy, but they don't believe that they can influence democracy and decision making. I'm saying this because in this paper of participatory inequality, in my view, uh, Klaus makes something very important in this debate. So he starts asking the question of the decline of voting and basically the fact that the people who normatively should be most interested to vote, the disadvantaged others, are even less voting than others, and how this is distorting policy process. But then he did something which, in my view, is very important, because when he's talking about different regimes uh, between the markets and the votes, and uh, there are other people in this room that wrote very interestingly on this, he do not call this a neoliberal order. He's distinguished between the social democratic relationship with the primacy of the politics, the neoliberal normative model, and he basically claimed that the austerity politics is a practice without normative justification. You are not saying this, that you're doing this because it is good. You're saying this, that you're doing this because nothing else could be done. I do believe it's a totally different moment. Because blaming neoliberalism is at least trying to find ideological justification. There is somebody you can argue with. It's easier in a way. I'm saying this because as a result of the crisis, personally I see the rise of two types of a, there is no alternative politics. One, which we see very strongly in Europe and especially with the latest development in the European Union, the message is there is no policy alternative. So you can change governments. And you can change governments as much as you want. Uh, in the case of my own country, Bulgaria, nobody was re-elected for the last 20 years. And for the last 10 years, party that was not taking part in the previous elections won the majority. We have been governed from the left, from the right, from the above, because we have a king from the prime minister, from below with the current prime minister. So you can change everything, but it's a protest vote. Democracy is about changing personnel. You're in charge of the human resources. What you cannot change is policies. 
On the other side, you have a different version of there is no alternative in the case of places like China and Russia. They're much more ready to play with policies. What you cannot change is people in power. So Mr. Putin can be a liberal, he can be statist, he could be anything. So from this point of view, the constraint is in a totally different place. Uh, and I find this very kind of uh, much more troubling. And from this point of view, when I was reading Klaus and the way he was describing this regime, I said, what it really reminds me of? And it reminds me very much of transition democracies. Democracies in which you have a very strong external constraints and where basically the normal democratic politics have been postponed for a while. The paradox is that in a certain way, 10 years ago, the transition democracy was told that you are not doing things like this and that, that policy consensus is so important, but in 10 years, you're going to be in a position much more free to make your political choices. So the idea was that, for example, France or Germany was the future of Bulgaria. Now, strangely enough, I do believe Bulgaria as a political model is much more the future for Germany and France uh, on the level of how much you can influence, especially the economic decision making. In the way in the Cold War democracy, the foreign policy have been basically taken out of the electoral politics. Now this is the economic decision making that is taken out of the electoral politics. So what remains in the politics now is passions. Using Hirschman's, basically parties should compete on passions because the economic austerity is very much perceived as the non-changing constraint. And my last point is why people believe that this system is sustainable. We see this, but it looks as a kind of a very dangerous system. There is kind of a normative deficit, uh, and there is a problem. And I do believe part of this comes not from the theory, but from the practice of East European transition. Because if you're going to ask practicing politicians which are the two most important lessons of transitions, they, they're going to tell you two things. First, that in Eastern Europe you had unpopular economic reforms that did not lead to a populist backlash. You can dismantle the welfare state without basically facing the people on the street. And secondly, you can have a very strong external intervention coming from the IMF after that from the European Commission, which is not going to delegitimize democratic institutions. Even more, in some of these countries, the trust in European institutions is higher than the trust in the national governments. And my idea is how to explain this. I'll not go basically explaining why there was no uh, 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 populist uh, response uh, to the unpopular economic policies. There is a book written already in 1998 by a Hungarian political scientist, Bela Grashkovic, called The Political Economy of Patience, which in my view makes a very important argument. It was also very contextual. It's very much about expectations, but this is also part of the communist legacy. Communism managed to weaken very much the capacity for collective action in the post-communist societies, and this explains very much why it worked. Second question is much more interesting, because in my view it's very much relevant for the European Union debate. Why a very strong intervention by the European Commissions? Why the fact that for one year Hungary in the Parliament only once voted a legislation, because all other voting has been adopting a key communitaire for the whole parliamentary year, why this was not perceived as problematic from the view of the public? And why it was not perceived problematic from the view of the elite? And this is my last point. I do believe that what changed with democracy is that now the demand for democracy comes from the elites, not from the people. Because democracy is the only type of government where you can be weak. The privilege of being weak and not delivering is very important in the system. It's very important to say, I cannot do this. And by the way, especially for this type of uh, governments, they're playing on two stages. For example, and this was very well studied in Latin America and other places, you go to the IMF and said, I cannot do this because of the people. You go to the people and you said, I cannot do this because of the IMF. At the end of the day, you're very selectively weak. You're very weak defending interests that you don't want to defend. And you're very kind of successful to defend interests that you want to defend. But why, from this, why people do not react? And here is the European story is very interesting. Because of a very strong anti-establishment and anti-elite sentiments, 
for the people, all this external pressure coming from Brussels is perceived as the only way to control their own corrupt elites. So now we have something that looks, unfortunately, as a bad equilibrium. Uh, so from this point of view, you can have a political system that does, does not make very much sense in theory, but can survive in practice. Thank you very much.